Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm reading from Luke in the 16th chapter, verses 19 to verse 31. Luke 16, verses 19 to 31. Uh, I was talking to someone about this. He, he brought up this passage um, recently, and, um, and and I remind him this is a story. Okay, Th this is not a, and, and by a story I mean not something that actually happened, but just a story. It's a way to think about things. Not that there's this man named Lazarus who does these things and this exactly is what happens to him and that this is what heaven is like. And, and so, But it's an idea, a concept that we get on. So it's in a sense a fictitious story, but with truthful purpose um, and, and teaching to us. So Luke chapter 16, verse 19. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and in fine linen, who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed from what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in his manner had in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated. What a sad thought. Unfortunately, a truth. People have had the scriptures, and often they neglect what has already been given to them in teaching that they cannot hear and understand the words of Jesus Christ himself and his death and resurrection. So this morning, as we continue to look through Paul's letter to Timothy, and we pointed out several weeks ago that as we understand Scripture, that whether this is written to a church or, or to another place or to a person like in this case to Timothy, it's also written to you and I because this is Scripture. That these words carry weight even for us. And so we hear them as if all of our name is Timothy. That we are Timothy and God has used Paul's writing to write a letter to us. Um, I, I chose this morning to just 
focus on this small section of the, the reading that if you were reading through in the lectionary this week, we're just going to look at verses 11 through 16. In 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter, and reading verse 11 through verse 16. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Jesus Christ who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ to which he will display at the proper time he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in inapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. The Christian faith is not a call to an easy life. It's not an automatic outcome that when we come to Christ that we have the guarantee of everything that we might imagine uh, that all of the promises. God has given us these promises, but we must live the Christian life to have them. They're not the check already been written. It's kind of like the, the paycheck. If, if you work, you know, the boss doesn't pay you for the rest of your life on the first day you show up. You got to show up. I was talking with Scott earlier. He was talking about having to, he was telling some employees about, you know, these are the things that we have to face and deal with and, 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 and how he needs these people. And, and if, if you're not doing your work, then... These people are not going to continue to use our business and, and so I'm going to end up having to lay off people. And that day four people said, mm, I don't want to do that kind of work and left. Yeah. You know, if you want the benefits, you got to put in the work. And so the Christian life is not that this guarantee. Oh, I've become a Christian. Therefore, I now get all the added untos. We must live the Christian life. And there are benefits and blessings all along the way. But we must live that life. And so Paul is, is writing to them. And Jesus reminded his disciples that the call to discipleship involves carrying one's own cross. And it may mean suffering. There may be difficult trials. So anyone who thinks that their longevity as a Christian releases them from continued discipleship, as if we can say, well, I've been a Christian for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. I don't need to put any more work into it. I want the retirement plan. There is no retirement plan in Christianity that you can sit back and say, ah, now I get to collect everything for the rest of my life. No, we must continue to be faithful. Anybody who thinks that they don't have to continue the practices of discipleship and accountability is deceived. From the beginning of Paul's letter to Timothy and to, to us, to anyone who hears this letter, Paul has been coaching on how to deal with false teaching that is out there. And so as we come to the end of this first letter, Paul gives a charge to Timothy. It's a charge that is issued in the presence of God. It is to be kept until the return of Jesus Christ. So there's no off-the-hook time. 
and it is to have the characteristics that emulate how Jesus kept his confession. Jesus was morally unstained, unblemished, without spot. And he was above reproach, without blame, demonstrating a personal integrity throughout his life. And we are called to live in that same way. I know that we may have difficulties and we may have faults and foibles and, and we may have fallings, but we pick ourselves up and we have to keep going and get back on that track so we're not off the hook. Overall, Paul is saying that it is something in the Christian life, it is not something simply to do, but it is a mandate to be. So it's not just simply a list of check marks, oh, I did this, I did that, I did this. But it is to be a Christian. Now, yes, that incorporates and involves doing some things along the way, but the focus is not to give a checklist to say, oh, okay, I did that one, I'm good for that. It is to be that, that these things incorporate into our life that they become the very fabric of the way that we think and respond all of the time. Not a checklist to do, but to become that. It's who we are on the inside that then comes out that all will see what we are like. So, one, that, that is actually... A, towards the middle or the latter part of this section that I just read. Now let's go back to the beginning of it and see, what does Paul actually charge? It begins with an emphatic address. But you, O oh man of God, now for some of you, so is it, but you, O oh woman of God, there's no one off the hook here. All of us are included in this. But you, O oh people of God, it's to be a strong contrast to those false teachers that Paul has been talking about, those who have wandered away from the faith. And so he uses this title from the Old Testament for those who are called the servants of God. Moses, Samuel, Elijah, Elisha, Daniel were given this title, man of God. And so Paul is saying that I'm using a title that has been a part of the faith from early in its history of here's who the people are that are the servants of God. And you are to be a man, a woman of God. That's your first charge. As believers, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we periodically need to be reminded that we are more than flesh and bones. Too often we look in the mirror and we see our faults and warbles. We see our pimples. We see our wrinkles and we get down about ourselves and say, oh, woe is us. Like Isaiah, as he's standing before God, he says, oh, woe is me. I am an unclean man among the people of unclean lips. A man of unclean lips among the people who are unclean. That we, we see all of the, the weaknesses that we have. But Paul wants us to say, no, you are the man of God. You are the woman of God. God has titled you. He has called you. You are his child. You are a child of the king. Remember that. That doesn't mean you got a crown on your head. 
But it means we have a responsibility to live up to. I remember as a child, and one day being called into my dad's office, my mom, I came home from school and, and mom telling me, dad wants you to see you over at his office. I, I think that was the first time I ever got called over to dad's office. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, I had done something. But dad wanted to remind me of my name. And my name is William Baggett Coker Jr. And he had worked long and hard and was working long and hard to create a name that had integrity. And I am Jr. I was to emulate that same integrity and that everything that I did reflected on him and if I lived my life well then all that he did would reflect on me and so as we live the Christian life as the child of God as a man of God as a woman of God all of who God is can be reflected in us and through us. And all that we do, how we live our life, reflects on what others think about God. On how they see God. Unfortunately, I've met people that say, oh yeah, yeah, I know that person. If that's what it means to be a Christian, I don't want anything of it. And that's not who we are to be. Paul is reminding us, you are to be the man and the woman of God. Hold your head up proud. And emulate that in and through all that you think and do. So then he goes on to then add to this charge with four exhortations, four intentional directives of what it means to live out this person as a people of God, as a man of God, a woman of God. And these are directives for daily life. He says that you are to flee from everything that I've mentioned before now. All these things that are characteristic of the false teachings. And so I encourage you to go back and read the earlier part of this chapter. But you're to free from the dabbling in false teachings and speculations. Uh, don't concern yourself with all those things that are speculative thoughts. Stay to the truth of what we know in the scripture. Instead of all the things that we will, I wonder if it could be like this, or I think you would like it like this, or... You know, I think there's an 18-hole golf course, and I think there's going to be a great big fishing pond loaded with, with perch and bass and all of this in heaven, and, and I'm going to spend all of heaven fishing, and, or I'm going to spend all of heaven down planting flowers in the garden, or that's what heaven's going to be like. And not mentioned once ever in the Scripture. So just take that out of the focus of your mind. Think about what it does talk about. Stay to these things that are in Scripture. Don't concern yourself with false teaching and speculations. He says, don't be caught up in divisiveness that's rooted in conceit and unhealthy controversy and quarrels there are so many things that, that have divided the church. Bickering and bantering over it's this way, it's that way, it's, you know, we got to do this, wear this, act like this, look like this. We got to sing like this, got to sing like that. And, and, and it divides the church. 
and divides people from realizing that we are the people of God, not the people of ourselves. It's not wrong to have some of those things, but, but not to make those things that died in the wall issues. To be not caught up in dissension and slander and friction for personal gain. This is what makes me happy. And if we don't do it the way I like it, then I'm not going. <gasps> Who's it about? As Kelly was saying, as we were singing, and that part, the, the, she loved that song because it was not about us. It's about God. It's about focusing on him. He is our audience. We're not an audience for each other. We're an audience before God. And so that's what we're to reflect. And then he talks about the dangers of loving money. Not the dangers of money. There are people that manage money quite well. There are people who don't manage money. They just get caught up in money. It's the love of money that becomes the problem. And so it tends to control their interests and their activities. It's all got to be about it. Got to get more. Got to get more. Got to get more. It's that Rockefeller's statement of what does it take to make a rich man happy? One dollar more. You know, yeah, today two dollars more. <laughs> Inflation, gotta double it. But you know, just gotta have more and more and more. Gotta do this, gotta do that. You know, I, I I'm never happy and contented with what I have. And Paul wrote to the Philippians and talked about I have learned to be content in all things. Whether I abound or I'm abased. Whether I have no fishing boat or I've got a nice fishing boat. Whether I've got a nice car or no car. Whether I've got a big house or a shanty. Doesn't matter. What matters is that I have the Lord. I'm caught up in all of those appearances. Or am I caught up in loving and serving the living God? So flee from all of those things. And then he says to pursue. The Christian life is an intentionally directed lifestyle. And he gives six qualities of spiritual activity that we are to pursue with our lives. To pursue righteousness. A life of faith in Christ. Abiding in the Holy Spirit. Living according to what God wills. Living the right way. Living in right relationship with God. Doing what pleases God. What would make Him happy. So righteousness and godliness. To devote ourselves to the works of piety. Daily prayer, the reading of scripture, weekly worship, regular participation in communion, regular engagement in Christian conferencing, discipleship, spiritual direction. If all those things sound unfamiliar to you, it's because you haven't been a part of 5Q. It's one of the things we talk about in our discipleship. And it is this participation in these things that we are doing daily, regularly, that are a part of bringing godliness into our life. That God would train us up in godliness. Training for all other things have value. Training for work, training for athletics, training for academics, all of that has its values. But what really matters in life now and eternally is training ourselves in godliness. And he says faith. An active trust in and obedience to God. 
a sanctified yes to whatever God says, whenever God says it. John Wesley commented in thinking about faith, he says, this is the foundation of righteousness, the support of godliness, and the root of every spiritual grace of the living spirit. Without faith, there is not righteousness or godliness or any of the other fruits of the Spirit in our lives. And then love. Reflecting God's love for us. And if you were to look at it in, in the Greek, the word there is agape. So this is to have the love that God has had for us and for all people. It's reflected in both our feelings, our compassion for others, and our actions, our engagement in other people's lives. In 5Q, we talk about not only are we to be involved in the acts of piety, the works of piety, but there must also be in our daily lives the works of mercy. The ministering to and the caring about other people's lives. In John Wesley's sermon on zeal, he said, Thus should the disciple show his zeal for works of piety, but much more for works of mercy. Whenever, therefore, one interferes with the other, works of mercy are to be preferred. Even reading and hearing and prayer are to be omitted or to be postponed at charity's almighty call. In other words, we cannot say that we love God if we are not actively demonstrating love towards others. If we are not showing love to other people in tangible ways, then we cannot say that we love God. Our lives must be characterized by acts of mercy. And then he says there must be steadfastness or endurance. The ability to hold on and to bear up under adversity with patience and persistence. stick to When the tough is going on, those who are true in Christ keep going on. And then finally, he says gentleness. It's a compound word that implies gentle and suffering together. So gentle is not just... <laughs> gentle is just like in the um, Beatitudes, blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. Meek is not his, he's weaky person. Meek is a person who is able to man, maintain calmness under pressure. Meekness is a diamond. Gentleness is a diamond. How do you get diamonds? Pressure. Cold under pressure. Black, nasty coal under pressure for a long time produces a diamond. So there must be that gentleness that is able to persevere and continue through the suffering and remain calm in trials. It begins with an attitude and then leads to a way of living. It enables the reduction of conflict. It enables reconciliation to come about with others because of gentleness. Oh, in, in Peter, he talks about we are to share the gospel. Be ready to Give a reason for the hope that is within you at all times with, I mean, I've said this first so many times, with 
gentleness and respect. So we share the gospel, but we do it in a way that doesn't take somebody and say, you need to become a Christian. No, we demonstrate it through our lives in a way that somebody says, man, I want to become like that. I love to see the way that person handles struggles and trials. I want to be like that. With gentleness. So these are the, the qualities that are to come through our lives. Then, then he gives the next exhortation. He says to fight. The fight is not talking about you need to go out there and beat people up. This is talking about the intensity in which we carry out this pattern of living. You, you've got to be strong. You've got to endure. You've got to hold on to it. Not relax in Christ life, to become Christ-like. The good fight of faith means it's going to take work. You're going to have to push through. Fight against yourself. When you want to just say, oh, I'm ready to give up. No. Fight on. Press on. Without being crushed. And then he talks about the last exhortation. He says, take hold of the eternal life. This is the, the goal and the prize. Hold on to eternal life. And eternal life is not just heaven. Eternal life is what Jesus said. I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Right now, eternal life begins the moment that we give our life to Jesus Christ. We hold on to that because he has promised to us an abundant life. Doesn't mean it's a life without trials, without struggles, but it is the abundance of his presence, his peace, his love, his grace in all circumstances. And we hold on to that. We pray for it. We say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, in my life, in my surroundings, as it is in heaven. Give me today, this day, my daily bread. Give me what I need for today to be the person that you need for me to be. And forgive me of my debts, my failings, my trespasses, as I forgive those who trespass against me. Hold on to the eternal life. Why does Paul give this charge? He says two reasons. One, God called you. In Paul's earlier letter to Ephesians, which is where Timothy is at, he told them that there is one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. You are called, each and every one of you, God has called you to become a child of God. To be a man, a woman of God. God is calling you. God is wanting that each and every one of you would come to be in a relationship with Him. It's not a panacea that God is going to, well, God is love and God's going to let everybody come to heaven. No. God calls everybody, but only those who come, who receive him, will know that promise of eternal life. And Timothy answered that call. He made the confession and said, Jesus Christ is Lord. 
And he did it in front of witnesses. It's why I, I through my own personal experience and, and as I have worked with people over the years, is, is if I'm praying with someone and encouraging outside of a worship service and they come to Christ, they accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, I say, okay, the next thing I need you to do is I need you to tell somebody about it. The next thing I need you to do is I need you to be in church as soon as possible and you need to come forward and kneel at the altar and make a public confession. Not that they haven't accepted Christ and Christ hasn't accepted them, but it is important that we make this public confession because the church comes around us and they call us to accountability to live and work with each other. And so Paul can say, you made that confession and you did it among others. They saw and heard you. And so I'm calling you into account for what you have done. And you say, wow, I don't know. This, this charge, this expectation is just too great. I don't know that I can do it. Remind you, who is the one that called you? You didn't call yourself to become a Christian. God called you. And the God who calls you will enable you. Yes. The God who calls you will work his grace in your life. For he and he alone is the sovereign one, the king of kings and lord of lords. He is all power. He is immortality. He is the one who grants eternal life because he is eternal life. We do not have eternal life within us. Read the passage in 1 Corinthians 15. And it's often read at a funeral. and talks about when the mortal, that's what we are, puts on immortality. In other words, we don't have immortality. We don't get to go to heaven unless God gives it to us. God is the one who is immortal. And he gives us immortality through the resurrection of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And through his grace, we can know that life. He is the one who is pure and blessed, holy. And so he has called you. And he who has called you will do it. If you give yourself to him fully, wherever you are, you say, well, I've done that before, but I'm not quite feeling like I've been a man of God, a woman of God. Then this morning I invite you to say, I need to step to the plate and be reminded. And Paul is reminding us today to claim that which God has called us to for his glory. That he might have all dominion in and through our lives. Praise be his name. As we respond to him, there are those who will be looking to you that they will see faithfulness in us and that they will respond to that faithfulness. And we're going to sing that as our prayer course this morning. May all who come behind us find us faithful. May we demonstrate the power of Christ in us that others may come to receive the power of God in their lives as well. If you don't know that for sure this morning, then I invite you to come and say, Lord, I give you myself for you to do all that you want to do in and through me. If you'll stand with me and join as we sing this chorus and join together in prayer.
May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe, and the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire. God, we thank you for your call upon our lives, for your grace that empowers us to be all that you have called us to be. Lord, may your spirit continue to guide and direct us in your transforming presence. May we know you are with us at all times and in all ways. To help us to be all that you have called us to be. Lord, as we look around and see those who follow us, may our children, our grandchildren, our neighbors, our friends, see a person who is faithful. That they too may come to know your saving grace. Lord, we thank you for what you have done, what you are doing, and what you will do in and through our lives. We give you praise in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so, Lord, now as we go from this time of worship and as we join together in a time of fellowship, we ask, Lord, that you would use the food that is prepared, the food that has been brought, to bring nourishment to our bodies. May the conversation around the table bring nourishment to our spirits. And may in all things you receive the glory, the honor, and the praise. And may we go into a world that so needs to hear and see you. May we go in your grace. Amen. Amen.